Hello everyone and salam alaikum. Thank you for joining us today on this dual live and virtual event. My name is Ritika, a marketing manager at Eurovets. It's a pleasure to have you all attend today. For those who don't know much about our company, Eurovets is a leading animal care solution provider in GCC region with a wide global brand portfolio for avian, companion, equine, camel, wildlife, and even production animals. Today, we are presenting biosecurity protocol, a key topic not only for humans, but also for our beloved pets, especially in the new normal climate. Welcome to all our audience live and all attending us here from Dubai International Horse Fair and those joining virtually and from across all GCC, Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, and even from South Africa. Welcome. For those here, please do visit us at uh, the Dubai International Horse Fair, Zabil Hall 6. We've got an exciting range to show you there. Today, our experts, uh, expert panel consists of two internationally renowned names from the veterinary industry, especially from the avian segment, Dr. Neil Forbes and Dr. Jamie Samoa. Dr. Neil Forbes qualified from the Royal Veterinary College in 1983. He is a diplomat of the European College of Zoological Medicine, specialist in avian medicine, and a fellow of the Royal Veterinary College. And Dr. Jamie Samoa graduated with honors at the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine in Veracruz in 1978. He is a European recognized veterinary specialist in zoological medicine. Welcome, experts. Today's Thank session will be conducted in two parts. First, we will pre present a video on birds of prey where Dr. Popes will discuss some key important areas. We will immediately follow this with a question answer session with our experts. Dr. Popes here is joining us from the UK. Hello. And Dr. Jamie from Bahrain. Hello, experts. Now, before we begin, just a little housekeeping for everyone. I, I request our live audience to please keep their mask on at all times. And we encourage active participation and welcome all questions after the short video. Right now, all our online participants are on mute just to avoid background noise so that you can, you're not distracted from, the list, from listening to the live webinar. Please keep all your questions for the last and then if you wish to ask, you can choose the question box at go to webinar control panel. If you'd rather ask in person, please click on raise your hand. We will unmute you and you will be able to ask your questions through your webcam or your mic. Uh, a recorded version of this webinar will be made available to all. Now over to my colleague, Dr. Amr Shala, who will translate the opening remarks in Arabic. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته في البداية نود أن نشكر سيادتكم على الانضمام لنا في حدث اليوم معكم عمرو صالح مدير التطوير مدير تطوير العملاء بشركة يوروبيتس ويشرفني حضوركم جميعا اليوم نحن شركة يوروبيتس لأدوية ومستلزمات البيطرية شركة رائدة في تقديم الخدمات البيطرية في الإمارات والخليج وكلاء وموزعون للعديد من الوكالات العالمية في مجال الحيوانات الأليفة والخيول والجمال والأبقار والماكس اليوم نقدم لكم بروتوكول الأمن البيولوجي ليس فقط الخاص بالإنسان بل وأيضا في مجال الإنتاج الحيواني والمعروف لدينا الآن بنيو نورمال مرحبا السادة الحضور بقاعة المؤتمر الدولي للخيول بدبي والسادة الحضور عبر المنصة الإلكترونية السادة الحضور بقاعة يرجى زيارة يوروفيت ستاند بقاعة زعبيل ستة لدينا العديد من المنتجات المميزة أثناء أيام المعرض محاضرتنا اليوم يلقيها اثنين من ألمع الأسماء المعروفة في مجال الطب البيطري وخصوصا الطيور دكتور نايل فوربس ودكتور جيمي سامور أولا دكتور نايل فوربس تخرج من الكلية الملكية للطب البيطري سنة 1983 
متخصص في علوم الطب الباطني للطيور وزميل الكلية الملكية البيطرية. ثانيا دكتور جاني شامور خريج كلية الطب البيطري لفيرا كروز مع مرتبة الشرف عام 1978 ويعد من الأطباء البارزين في أوروبا في علم الحيوان. محاضرة اليوم تنقسم إلى جزئين. سنقدم مقطع فيديو عن الطيور الجارحة حيث سيناقش دكتور فوربس بعض النقاط المحورية. عقب هذا المقطع مباشرة سيكون معنا دكتور فوربس من المملكة المتحدة ودكتور سامور من المملكة البحرينية على الهواء للإجابة على أسئلتكم برجاء الالتزام بارتداء الأقنعة الطبية وفي انتظار مشاركتكم وأسئلتكم عقب المقطع. شكرا. Thank you, Amr, for that introduction. Now, without further ado, we will begin with the video presentation. Hello, my name is Neil Forbes. I'm a Royal College of Veterinary Surgeon Specialist in Bird Medicine and a European Diplomat of the European College of Zoological Medicine, Avian. It's my great pleasure and uh, privileged to be talking to you today, not only as a user of F10 for the previous 20 plus years, but I'm pleased to now say that I am the veterinary uh, advisor to health and hygiene. So today we're going to be talking about birds of prey and in particular how we use F10 in respect of birds of prey. Before we start that, I just want to introduce this by saying why F10, why do I have confidence in it? Well, at the end of the day, what makes F10 different? And the answer is that F10 is health and hygiene is an ethical and evidence-based company. We have safety testing of all the finished end products. So rather than just testing the constituents, it's the end product that's gonna get used by government approved accredited quality controlled laboratories in consideration of both skin, eye and respiratory uh, toxicities. We also have efficacy testing again of all finished end products by government accredited quality controlled laboratories and on the health and hygiene website, there's a considerable amount of information, not only testimonials, but also all the safety and efficacy data, the application instructions and much, much more, all available on the website. I'm not going to go through all the links with you uh, because they are all uh, provided for you on the YouTube contents page. So there are the links there, but I'm not going to go through them with you now. Health and hygiene provides added value to all its products across its range with training and education of both distributors, clients and end users with this and similar presentations together with that comprehensive fact packed website. So looking at falconry, in 2016 UNESCO added falconry to the list of intangible cultural heritage of humanities. And basically what that means is that falconry is legally protected in all countries of the world that are signed up to UNESCO. Falconry is popular in many countries around the globe, but in the Middle East, it holds a position somewhere between religion and football. Traditionally, falconry in the Middle East involved wild caught Saker falcons, now listed as an IUCN endangered species. To a greater extent, wild caught birds are now replaced by captive bred, not only Sakers, but also Jer falcons, peregrines, and hybrids of those. These are generally bred in other parts of the world then shipped to the Middle East. The traditional quarry for, for falcons in the Middle East was Hubara Bustard, who were listed as vulnerable in 2001. That means a high risk of extinction in the wild and then placed on the red list in 2014 and raised to near threatened in 2015. So what does that all mean? Well, it means that Middle East falconers have been under considerable pressure to cease taking falcons and hubara from the wild and instead to use captive bred falcons and hubara to meet their requirements. That means that with the breeding, typically not in the Middle East but elsewhere in the world, the transport and the medical care of both groups are very, very important. And with this constant breeding, transport, quarantine movement and so on, it means that falcons are a being stressed by all of that and secondly, they're being moved around, they're being mixed, and that gives the potential 
for the transfer of contagious infection. For an Arab man, his falcons are of great importance, coming second only to his camels and sadly ahead of his wives and his children. So here we have images on the on the left hand side, Hubara busted a, a, a mural, uh, mother and chicks, and then on the right hand side, some captive bred chicks. So what are the challenges in the care of birds of prey? Well, we have disease risks, the species kept, and the husbandry provided and disease risks associated with that vary greatly from region to region, depending where you're looking after them. As I said before, with imports, exports, markets, competitions, hunting trips, veterinary tricks, it's typically very challenging to maintain biosecurity in a collection of falcons, because by definition of what they're doing, they are not a closed collection. And that means that it's sensible to manage the group as though this won't be achieved, because in reality, it's not practical. And that means we then have to control anticipated contagious diseases. And the only way for us to do that is to fog routinely with F10 SC at 1 in 250 concentration. So the great thing is don't wait for infection, don't wait for disease, but control it and prevent it before it happens, because we know that that risk and that threat is ever present. So what are the commonest pathogens that we have to deal with? Well, we have viruses, obviously avian influenza, West Nile virus, Newcastle disease and avian pox. Those are the main ones. Bacteria, we have E. coli, Pseudomonas, Staphylococcus, Klebsiella and Staph aureus. Again, not, that's not a complete list, but those are the main ones we're concerned about. And then when it comes to fungi, of course, the big one, really important, is Aspergillus, but also in terms of uh, gut infection, then Candida. The great news is that, of course, all of these pathogens are controlled by F10. In terms of common disease risks, so forgetting about the, the contagious problems, but other things that cause birds to be presented to veterinary facilities, we have trauma, in particular broken feathers, about 40% of all veterinary presentations will be for imping, uh, broken bones, beaks, and so on. The contagious ones we've mentioned, AI, Newcastle disease, West Nile virus, avian pox, tuberculosis, uh, E. coli, Pseudomonas, and Staphylococcus aureus. There are, of course, metabolic diseases that cause birds to be presented, heavy metal poisoning, toxicities, and amyloidosis. And bumblefoot, uh, we have a separate presentation, so please look at that. And the same goes for respiratory diseases. We have, again, we have a separate presentation, which is well worth viewing. In terms of gut problems, our main diseases we're concerned about is E. coli, Salmonella, Campylobacter, and sauerkraut. So my point is that with birds coming in and out of a collection, with birds going off to hunting trips, going off to the vet, being exposed to markets, eating quarry that is of unknown health status, regular fogging to prevent that passage of contagious disease is really, really important. The risk of contagious infection within any group is inevitably high. So fogging with F10, uh, at least once, if not three times, up to three times daily uh, for half an hour. And that can be done during the daytime because, of course, it's safe to fog with birds present and with members of staff present. But just to make it more convenient, you may well want to do it um, after you close in the afternoon uh, and then middle of the night and first thing in the morning. F10 is safe to use for fogging because it's non corrosive to metal and safe for inhalation by birds and staff. And we have safety data to show that. And that really is pretty well unique in terms of a disinfectant that is safe and effective to be used in that way. Here we have a, a, a shot of a multi-port uh, static fogging unit um, suspended in the roof of a, a large building. And here we see it in action. This was a, a very large building, probably 100 yards long and uh, 40, 40 meters wide and the whole building was being fogged three times a day to control contagious infection. Very effectively as well, I may add. So F10 use in falconry, infection control and biosecurity, absolutely key, really, really important. So any new or returning animals to the group should go through a quarantine process. And if you can't put them in quarantine, you have to treat the whole group as though they're in quarantine. By definition, Quarantine is a dirty place 
with animals of unknown health status who may well be shedding pathogens. The same, of course, applies for sick falcons within any collection. Unless they're in their own airspace, F10 fogging is absolutely indicated to prevent them passing infection to other birds. Prevention and treatment of bumblefoot, so have a look at that separate presentation, and the same applies to respiratory infections. I'm indebted to Dr. Ali and colleagues who at the Doha Falcon Conference in 2014 demonstrated the instance of pathogenic bacteria which they isolated in their hospital. Of all the bacterial infections, 27% were due to Pseudomonas, and that of course we know is from the supply of, un of contaminated unhygienic water. E. coli, which is all to do with poor food uh, hygiene, 17%, and Staphylococcus, 6%. Staphylococcus isn't found on falcon's feet, it comes from the falconer's hands and it's the main cause of bumblefoot. So what we're saying is those three pathogens, Pseudomonas, E. coli and Staphylococcus, is responsible for 49% of all bacterial infections and all of those are down to bad hygiene and are completely controllable by the use of F10. So we have a problem. There's a proven hygiene issue with falcon collections. Food hygiene, that means from the killing, the freezing, the storage, the defrosting, the preparation, the feeding. If at any point in that process, if the food is sitting around at ambient temperature, bacteria proliferate and that results in sick birds. Good hygiene and the use of F10 disinfection at one in 250, F10 SC, uh, for all the boards, the knives, the food bowls, the trays is absolutely vital. When it comes to water hygiene, this is all to do with uh, falconry collections where they have a header tank of water. Even if there's chlorine in the water and it's mains water, if that water is sitting in a tank being heated by the sun every day, Pseudomonas will grow in it. So Pseudomonas proliferates, it's then obviously provided to the birds uh, for their, their drinking water and is rapidly fatal. Remember, 27% of bacterial infections was caused by pseudomonas. How do we avoid it? Well, the answer is avoid using header tanks, and if you are using them, you must add F10SC at one in 500 into the water tank on a continual basis to prevent that pseudomonas growth. Remember also, if you're using a water hose to fill up birds' water bars, let it run clear before you use it, because again, the water sitting in the hose being warmed by the sunshine will also allow pseudomonas to grow. And with the water bowls in the bird's aviaries, then add F10SC at one in 500 to the water, again, to prevent proliferation of bacteria. In terms of bumblefoot, uh, as I said before, the Staphylococcus comes from the falconer's hands. It gets onto the, bum onto the falcon's foot, and then gives rise to bumblefoot. It's a major factor in the etiology of bumblefoot. So how do we control that? See another separate, uh, separate presentation. But the key is you use F10 germicidal barrier cream rubbed into those feet on a twice weekly basis to prevent problems. And then you use F10 SC1 and 250 to spray perches. It's, AstroTurf is a wonderful uh, product for perch surfaces but it does allow the maintenance of a bacterial population on that perch. So if you're using AstroTurf, you must sanitize those perches on at least an every other day basis. We also need to control insect vector diseases. There's strong evidence that amyloidosis occurs subsequent to an insect spread viral infection. And these images here, we can see at the bottom, a little pox lesion on this bird's eyelid, and we can see wet pox lesions on this bird's feet. Um, we also have to think about West Nile virus. Uh, avian pox are shown here um, uh, uh, as all diseases being spread by insects. So what we need to do is to use the F10 uh, germicidal spray with insecticide and spray uh, if we put some wind sheeting, uh, windproofing sheeting on the sides of the aviary and spray those with the uh, germicidal spray with insecticide, that will uh, vastly reduce the biting insects that will be transferring infection to these birds. Other diseases that are insect spread, 
Babesia, Hemoprotus, Leucocytosan, and Plasmodium, all blood parasites, which of course are all spread by biting insects. So as I say, spray F10 with insecticide uh, onto the webbing material on the aviary sides and roof to minimize insect intrusion. So thank you very much for your time. All the references that we have here again are on the YouTube um, information uh, portal. So have a look there. I hope you found this useful. Do please come and join us for our Bumblefoot, our respiratory disease. We also have uh, webinars on um, hatchery management and also for dealers, vendors and agents of falcons. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you found it useful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Forbes, for that insightful video presentation. Now, I would request our virtual audience to please type your questions in the question box. Should you want to ask it uh, live, please raise your hand. Now, for our live audience, you can come forward to the podium if you would like to ask any questions. And we will take questions in Arabic as well. My colleague, Ya Amar, will translate them. Amar? Shukran uh, Dr. Forbes. شكرا لك يا دكتور على هذا الفيديو المفيد يرجى من جمهورنا الافتراضي كتابة الأسئلة في مربع الأسئلة أو رفع اليدين إذا كان يريد أن يلقي سؤاله على الهواء والحضور ندعوكم إلى المنصة لطرح أسئلتكم يمكنكم خط الأقناع أثناء طرح أسئلتكم ولكم جزيرة السلطة We have a first question from our participant from Bahrain Dr. Forbes, would you like to start with that? Yes, certainly. I think my, my response is probably going to be uh, quicker, simpler, but possibly less useful than, than my colleague Jaime's. Um, certainly in Europe and the UK, um, yes, we do recognize uh, exercise. So, so I'll just repeat the question for anyone who may not be able to read it. Uh, the question is, please discuss the etiology, the management and prognosis of brief exercise induced seizures in falcons and how can we control the spread of bacterial infection post seizures in falcons? Now, from our experience in the UK and in Europe, uh, what we would say is, yes, we do see uh, exercise-induced seizures, but in our cases, uh, those seizures are always, uh, the etiology is always nutritional and metabolic. And so the key thing for us is to actually get hold of the birds at the, as, as soon as they've had the seizure. So what I will do is I'll go out to where the birds are being exercised and, and fly the bird and then take a blood sample straight away. And, and typically what we're looking at is the blood glucose level and the blood calcium level. And remember that it's the ionized calcium we need to look at, not the total calcium. Um, and typically it'll be one of those two. Um, if it's a glucose issue, it's just that the bird is in perhaps too low a condition and they're not mobilizing glucose uh, glyc glycogen from the liver quickly enough. If it's calcium, that will be a nutritional issue because of a insufficient quantity of bone in the diet. Um, but it may well be that Jaime can add something. Uh, it, it may well be that we have uh, maybe uh, effects from low-grade Newcastle disease or, or something in the Middle East uh, sector that you can share with us. Well, um, if I can just add to what you said, uh, we have recognized this condition for, for a long, long, long time. And we have done studies uh, post-mortem uh, and we have been able to uh, detect uh, permanent lesions at the brain level. And this seems to be all related to vitamin E deficiency. Okay. But uh, 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 when it comes to the calcium, the glucose, the, the general condition of the bird, is all uh, related to nutrition, uh, the use of meat diet rather than uh, the rough fish, the bones, the, the variety, and mainly the use of pigeons. A, a, a medium-sized pigeon weighs about 250 grams to 300 grams. Uh, if these are fed falcons, the falcon cannot eat the whole pigeon. It can eat only the meat, and they will actually go to the chest mainly. So that is highly deficient in calcium, highly deficient in vitamins, the calcium phosphorus ratios is low. And uh, we keep telling falconers that the variety uh, is very important when it comes to feeding birds and the supplementation 
but you know, traditions and customs and the practicalities always shift the, the, the diet to, to give all meat diets rather than a much more comprehensive, the use of the old chicks, the use of mice, uh, the use of chicken livers, the use of uh, other items uh, to uh, supply the needs of a falcon. At the end of the day, a falcon in training is an athlete and it cannot be maintained with the same diet all the year round. It's as simple as that. So I agree entirely with you on the nutritional side. And yeah, just, just to pick up on the vitamin E issue, uh, because some of the listeners may not be aware that uh, typically a vitamin E uh, deficiency will occur, not because you're not feeding enough vitamin E, but because you're storing the food for too long. So vitamin E and selenium deficiencies go hand in hand. Uh, and uh, what we would always say is don't store the food longer than the similar type of meat is recommended to be stored prior to human use. Um, so that, that, that's yeah. obviously important. Thank you. There is Thank you, experts. Yeah. We've received our next question. They've asked, can nibbleization of F10 be beneficial to non-avian uh, species? Thank you. Thank you very much. Whoever um, posed that question, that's a really interesting question. And and um, as we said before, there, there will be a whole range of webinars uh, with useful information on different subjects. And um, certainly these will include uh, the control of respiratory infections in non-avian species. From my point, uh, from my point of view, clinically, I've used this many, many times in in my exotic animal practice. So uh, treating uh, rodents and rabbits, um, uh, but also. Uh, so I think I think there's two aspects. One is the treatment of a sick animal with a respiratory problem, and yes, you can use it in horses, in cattle, in sheep, and and so forth. But probably more importantly than that is to use it to prevent the problem in the first place. Um, F10 fogged to prevent the transfer of infection from animal to animal. So if you're talking about companion animals, you've got cats with cat flu. The, the estimation, the published data tells us that 80 to 90% of cats have cat flu. They are carriers for cat flu. Yeah. And that means that as soon as they're stressed, they tend to shed it. So the cat is ill and it goes into a veterinary hospital. It's gonna be stressed the cat goes into a boarding facility, it's going to be stressed. So rather than waiting for the cat to have cat flu and spread it to every other cat in that facility, the sensible thing to do is again to have a, a permanently fixed fogging machine with automated fogging times and control any virus that's in the airspace. And remember, the whole point is you use a disinfectant by a route to control the route of transfer of infection. So if you're talking about parvovirus in dogs, fogging isn't that useful. But if you're talking about an air spread infection, so that might be chlamydia or cystine beacon feather disease or avian influenza um, or in cats, cat flu, in dogs, kennel cough, then the very best way to control that spread of infection is by using fogging. So absolutely very, very useful um, in, in all species. And, and I know quite a few people who um, who are users of uh, of F10 who actually use it themselves um, after a, an air flight or something of that type? They actually uh, flush their their nasal passage out either before or after or both. So you know it's safe in humans, it's safe in all animals, and uh, yeah, great to use. Thank you, Dr. Forbes. We have another one on nebulization. Okay, so what particle size is recommended for nebulization when treating aspergillosis in avian patients? Okay, so this is treatment, not prevention. And there we talk about nebulizing rather than fogging. Uh, there are different types of nebulizing machines. Uh, ionizing nebulizing machines probably achieve a smaller particle size. But what we're aiming for is a particle size of between 0.5 and 2 mu. Okay, so when you're purchasing a nebulizer, you must make sure it is a machine that will deliver uh, a particle size that's small enough. Uh, if I may add this, uh, this is one of the major concerns when it comes to the use of uh, fogging. That people go and buy a unit without actually knowing the size of the particle that the, 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 out, the outlet. 
and uh, the birds end up, or the, the animals uh, in the room or in the chamber, end up completely wet because the particle size is too large. And then uh, the, you are not actually nebulizing or fogging, you're almost spraying, uh, which is very difficult. Particle size is very important to allow penetration, inhalation uh, to, the, uh, to the upper respiratory uh, tract. But what we have to remember here, going back to what Neil was saying uh, concerning the use of F10 in other species, uh, it can be used everywhere. Uh, I mean, it can be used not only in the environment, uh, not only on the on the animals themselves uh, as prevention, as, as part of the biosecurity, uh, but basically everywhere where animals are kept. The idea is uh, to keep levels of pathogens to the minimum and to uh, prevent the conditions spreading to other animals and indeed to humans. Thank you, Jamie. That's very useful. Very, very. That's you're another, absolutely right. Very, very important. Yeah. There's another question there. That did uh, answer another question that we had in the chat box, which did ask for the size of uh, nip, uh, droplet for mm. nebulization. I but think, now yeah. we have another one for uh, from Mudasir. Okay, so the question is how how helpful is F10 if it's used to flush sinuses while treating sinusitis in falcons? Uh, I'm pleased to suggest a dilution rate, and and I would encourage you, invite you to look at the webinar on the treatment of respiratory infections in birds of prey because we do deal with this and we show pictures of it in there. Uh, but the, the simple answer, and I can say this as a, a human who has suffered from sinusitis myself, that it doesn't matter how much systemic medication you give, when your patient is suffering from sinusitis, systemic medication is not going to solve the problem. The only way to solve it is to flush the sinuses out, to get good drainage from the sinuses. So what we would do initially in this situation, um, we would, uh, for on, on the first occasion, we would anesthetize the falcon, intubate it so the airway is protected, flush the sinuses to get a, a sample for diagnostic testing so that we know what the bug is and how we're going to control it. But then we would um, we would send the falcon home, and yes, we would ask uh, the owner to carry on flushing the falcon on a daily basis. The important thing when you do this, you you have someone, one person holding the bird's feet and body, and then the person who's doing the flushing, you hold the head, you have the head pointing down towards the floor, and you do not shut the bird's mouth. Um, and then you take, a, I would take a 10 mil syringe loaded with F10SC and I would use a 1 in 250 solution. Um, for veterinary surgeons present, I would just make one suggestion to you. If you are dispensing or you're advising your clients to use flushing, uh, F10 for flushing in sinuses, um, give them a diluted solution to use. Okay, I have once had a situation where uh, I gave a client a, a bottle of concentrated SC, F, F10 SC, uh, with instructions to dilute, and they didn't do it. And, and that would be dangerous for the bird. So I, I would always recommend use it, um, dispense it diluted. I would dilute in saline, not in water. Um, so if you took a litre of, of saline, just introduce four mils of F10 SC into that litre, and then that makes a good... Uh, one in 250 solution, and then you flush 10 mils from one side, 10 mils from the other side, with the head down, with the mouth open, so that when the fluid comes through the sinuses into the mouth, it drains out rather than any risk of it going down the windpipe. Uh, and we do that once a day, and I would do it for 10 to 14 days, and typically, in my experience, that's long enough. Jaime, do you have different experiences? Uh, well, no, I have been using um, F10 for flushing the sinuses for over 20 years, basically since F10 came into the market <laughs> in the Middle East. Yeah. And I have used this, the same dilution, 1 to 250 in saline. And uh, what I normally do, I use a 20 mil syringe, Neil, and, and I put an adapter in the tip, which is basically an inverted um, a plunger of a 3 mil syringe. Uh, so when it's adapted to the no to the nair, uh, it doesn't damage the operculum. Sure. So it's like a little adapter and, and flashing the same way. 
uh, do it twice a day while the antibiotic therapy is going on. There is no other way of the bulking all that caseous mass, the caseous mass yeah. that are formed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It could be trichomoniasis, it could be pseudomoniasis, or it could be a mix. Very common here right now is pseudomoniasis when the weather changes. Uh, yeah. It's just incredible the number of cases that the, the clinicians have been reporting. And F10 is just an integral part of that treatment, together with obviously the antibiotic, yes, but very yeah. common in other countries where they actually um, uh, mold birds on the floor is the obstruction of the nariz with fine sand. And it forms originally a mechanical obstruction, but soon becomes infectious. And there is nothing else uh, better than flushing uh, hmm. using this system, of course. Yeah. Great. So I see we have another question here. And the question comes from Nissan, who's asked, can we use F10 in drinking water of, of, of birds to prevent viral infections? Well, I mean, what we've talked about so far is using F10SC at one in 500 in the water um, to prevent pseudomonas infections. Um, and if you were to have a situation, uh, well, the first point I would make is always make sure that your water bath is somewhere where neither the falcon nor a wild bird can defecate into it, uh, because that's that would be the the greatest uh, risk of introducing virus in that way, if that were to happen. Um, in, in terms of, can we put F10 in the water to prevent um, respiratory infection due to viruses? That's not gonna work as well as fogging is, uh, because obviously the F10 in the water is absorbed into the it's taken in by the by the mouth and it goes into the crop and it goes into the gut it's it's not like an antibiotic it doesn't get into the body system it doesn't go around the bloodstream and control the virus in that respect mm -hmm. so the f10 in the water will sanitize the water it will help to reduce uh, infection in the gut if the bird is drinking it. So, for example, E. coli from bad food hygiene, yes, that would be useful. Um, if it was an enteric, a gut active virus, yes, it would be useful. But a respiratory virus, my view would be you, you really ought to be aiming for the fogging. Jaime, do you have any input on that one? Well, basically, the, the most common uh, viral diseases in falcons in this area of the world are first of all, Newcastle disease. And uh, uh, the second most important is inclusion for the herpes virus hepatitis. Yeah. Those would be the, the most important one. And although no uh, uh, people are not actually reporting it publicly, avian influenza has become a major issue in this part of the world. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, the system wants to keep it uh, quiet. But uh, the veterinarians that deal with falcons, they know this very well, mm. and uh, it has become a real issue. So falcons outside the country, when they go hunting, they, a, a lot of them come back with avian, uh, no, with avian influenza, but also a pox virus. And all of this can be prevented, obviously, through vaccination and through the, use, the, the wise use of a biosecurity program, including disinfection, but also isolation and common sense, which doesn't happen very often, unfortunately. Birds right now are mixed together uh, because of the races. So you have birds coming from different countries, from different localities. Some of them are vaccinated, some of them are not, and everything goes together during the races. And that has created an enormous uh, issue when it comes to biosecurity and people have to be mindful that this can happen. It's not only the old, the old trick of going hunting and you know joining just one or two hunting parties, but these are hundreds of people coming together with their falcons and the risk of transmission is just scandalous. Yeah, yeah. 
I, that, that's very, very true. And this is a point that we've, one of our other webinars is about the use of F10 with birds of prey in a falcon hospital situation. And again, you, you think about that, you know, in the peak of the season, some of these hospitals are taking in maybe 200 birds or more a day. They all go through one diagnostic room. They're handled by the yeah. same staff mm -hmm. who have the same uniforms on. And then any birds that get uh, hospitalized, um, you know, some hospitals I know will, will separate them, but I've been places where you've got 70 or 80 falcons in one room okay. Okay. and they're yeah. all sick and, and no one's doing anything about preventing the transfer of infection from one bird to another. So again, my point is, you know, that diagnostic room should be fogged regularly. Obviously, staff should yeah. be changing clothing and wearing PPE. And if you are admitting birds, then again, the room th that you're admitting them to, you should separate them into small groups and they should all be fogged on a routine basis. But I can just also pick up your one point, I digress slightly, but the, the point about the herpes, the inclusion body herpes virus, uh, and of course the issue there, I mean, we see it very rarely in the UK and that's because Falcons get herpes virus because they eat pigeons where the pigeon is infected with a herpes virus. And the herpes virus is not pathogenic to the pigeon. Now, in the yeah. UK, herpes virus in pigeons is not endemic. It is in Europe. And if we've had situations where falconers have used perhaps racing pigeons, um, that are the, the old racing pigeons that have raced from Europe back to the UK, or they've had falcons, they've been flying them on the south coast of England, where wild pigeons are flying across the British Channel, and they've been they've been caught there. So, so very much from our point of view is falcons in the UK get herpes virus only when they eat birds that have been flying in Europe. And of course, you mentioned before, Jaime, that traditionally so many of your falconers there are feeding pigeons to their falcons and and they really need to 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 wake up and realize that actually yeah. there is an enormous disease risk in doing that um and even if the pigeon is frozen freezing does not kill herpes virus no. or tuberculosis or salmonella um, and therefore actually working on you know, don't wait for your falcon to get sick, but look at the underlying cause of why you have a problem, whether that's biosecurity, and as you mentioned, all these birds meeting together, uh, spreading infection, um, whether it's that or whether it's the diet, it doesn't matter. And just to pick up the point about the biosecurity, the picture that I had in my webinar with the overhead multi-ported uh, fogging machine and then the room that was full of, of uh, cages which actually had Hubara busted in, that was going on uh, because I arrived at the site and, they, and, and on the day I arrived, they had the confirmation that that was an avian influenza outbreak. And we actually went through that collection. We had um, uh, six rooms that were 100 meters by 40 meters with 300 Hubara individually housed in each room. And we actually went through the whole lot. We gave them a human antiviral drug and we started fogging um, with uh, with F10. And before I got there, uh, they were losing 30, 40, 50 birds a day within 48 hours of starting the medication and using the fogging. And the fogging was just as important as the medication. We had no further losses. So, you know, avian influenza can be controlled. Again, if you just uh, accept what you've got and you control it. And of course, the crucial thing is then finding out the serotype of the strain of avian influenza you have so that you can vaccinate birds in future. But biosecurity and use of fogging really can nail these highly contagious diseases. Now, in the last 15 years, and in fact, the first outbreak of, um, uh, I cannot mention the country, uh, the first outbreak of avian influenza uh, in the Middle East started with newly imported uh, falcons that didn't go into an isolation or quarantine and they were just spread across the country. The second uh, was in an isolation facility. The third one was in a molting facility. And subsequently, a lot of the infections, outbreak of infections have been in falcon hospitals. Yeah. In hospital wards and yeah. isolation wards. Yeah. 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 And uh, to the point that many clinicians now, what they do, whenever they get a suspicious bird, 
at least they do a, an antigen capture test yep. before yep. Ad, ad, uh, uh, risking the admission. Uh, sure. There are uh, they are available for avian influenza, Newcastle disease, yeah. and, uh, but people are becoming much more aware. I mean, I know people who have lost a large number of birds mm -hmm. due to, uh, mm -hmm. here in the Middle East mm -hmm. uh, in um, uh, even breeding centers due to yeah. uh, mixing up, bringing birds in and not having any biosecurity. And just to go back to the the webinar that we have about um, F10 use in the Falcon Hospital, one of the points I make there is that actually you should be assessing the risk of the patient before they are admitted even to a reception area. And you should ideally have two different reception areas, two different diagnostic areas, and two different lots of wards. So basically you have a clean area and a dirty area. And the dirty area have, is, is staffed by dirty staff and you use lots and lots of biosecurity because you know the risk is there. So it's, it's really a question of wake up guys, prevent problems rather than waiting for all these falcons yeah. to die. Well, people are becoming think, much more aware of that. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I think we've got a live question now. Thank you. Thank you, experts. Yes, we've got Mohammed Mazin online. You're on unmute now. Dr. Mazin? I think he's facing an issue with his mic. So we will move on to the next. We've got Dr. Martin online. Sorry, I, we cannot hear you. So I'm gonna to move to another question that we've received in the chat box. Okay, how effective is F10 in killing and eradicating microorganisms in poultry farms? That's another really great question. And in fact, F10 has done a lot of research in this field already. Uh, and the answer is, you know, F, F10 as a, as a disinfectant, uh, and I'm not gonna go through all the constituents and why it works, but just simply to tell you, it's, and, and remember, we've got all the efficacy certificates to show that it's effective against avian influenza, Newcastle disease, et cetera, salmonella, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, it works really, really well in poultry farms. Um, Health and Hygiene have done research where they've actually put F10 in the drinking water of poultry uh, and they've shown that the meat is safe and effective and, and is not a danger to anyone afterwards and growth rates have been improved and the birds have done really really well so yes it, it can be used in you know in a lot of uh, farm wildlife zoo as well as bird and companion animal situations thank you for dr Pope's. Now we have another question in the chat box. Okay, so the next question, this is a, a great question and thank you very much for raising this one. What is your opinion on the principle of cycling? So in other words, using different biocidal compounds, whether you're talking about disinfectants, antiseptics and anti-infective uh, agents to, to prevent antimicrobial resistance. I've seen this in a majority of practices, not confined to avian, but also in livestock farms clinics, uh, with two or three different brands of disinfectant used and switched around in cycles. Okay, well, the first thing to say is that I just want to just to explain about use of F10 with antimicrobial resistance. The fact that F10 has got two main active ingredients means that actually it's you're much less likely to get a microbe becoming resistant to F10 because you've got two different active ingredients there that are synergistic in the way they work. The other point to, to raise is that if you're dealing with clinical cases, and I was in a hospital uh, three or four weeks ago dealing with a parrot with a Klebsiella, a multi-multi-resistant Klebsiella, and Basically, what we did is is we we flushed that bird's sinuses with F10, um, and uh, we we then we we did that for a week, ten days. We then recultured it, and the test result was different in as much as yes, there was still a Klebsiella there, but the Klebsiella that was there 
was by then sensitive to antimicrobial resistance. We then carried on with F10 and the antimicrobial and we cured the infection. So I'm saying, I just want to share with you that actually F10 can be really, really useful. And, and I've done things like flushing bladders out where uh, you've got multi-resistant um, bacteria in the bladder. Uh, I've done it with obviously abscesses. We've done it with ear canals, both in rabbits, birds, and in reptiles. Um, so all sorts of uses where, where you can do that. Now, coming back to the question of cycling, you know, it, does it make sense to change between one product and another? Um, I'm, I'm not convinced that there's any um, academic uh, published data that actually shows us we have to do it. But having said which, I don't think, it, you know, if, if that makes you feel better about things, I don't think it's a bad thing to do. Um, but of course, um, you you don't have to use one for nine months and then another one for nine months. Actually, if you think there might be a, a buildup or potential for antimicrobial resistance, if you're using one product, let's say you were using F10, maybe you, you use something else for a month and then you can go back to F10. Uh, because as long as you have a break in it, any potential, um, which as I say, would be less because of the, the two active ingredients, uh, but just a short break would be enough to uh, break any potentials. Jaime, do you want to input on that? Well, the thing is, uh, most of the, the, the farm animals are, are short-lived. I mean, you, you, you're talking about poultry. Uh, yeah. Uh, poultry, yeah, they, they don't stay there forever. So uh, they they go out and the facilities obviously have to be clean and disinfected properly. But uh, the, 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 the use of a, a, a separated or intermediate agent um, uh, in, in the... In the uh, biosecurity program, I think is also recommended. One of the problems yeah. is that we don't really clean the facilities properly. Uh, thank, you. Clean, thank you for raising yeah. that, yeah. <laughs> they are not cleaned properly. Uh, the thing is, we, we always recommend to, to use first water, just plain water, and spray the place up to remove any debris, any dirt, and then disinfect the place. Uh, people do it the other way around. They disinfect yeah. first, and then they wash it down. Yeah. Uh, I, I would, um, common sense. It, yeah, if I can just pick up that point, because I think it's important that we share the, the, the really correct way. Firstly, any the sanitization of any surface or any object is a two-stage process. The first should be a proper cleaning. And actually, we would recommend uh, using a detergent, so a soapy uh, product. Uh, you can use the F10 um, X, uh, SCU. Um, yeah. Uh, XD, which is a F10 with a disinfect with a detergent, but certainly the first is a, a good wash. Uh, warm water and soap is great. Once you've cleaned it, you then use the disinfectant. And of course, just to stress, really, really important, you must use F10 at the right concentration for the pathogen, the, the most resistant pathogen that might be there. So you've got to do your homework, wh why, work out what your pathogens could be, then go to the F10 website and check what the concentration should be to control that particular pathogen. And then having got the concentration right, you must have the appropriate contact time as well and again that is given on the health and hygiene website and very often this will be something like five or ten minutes and and so for example if you're working in a, a veterinary practice you have to work out if you're going to spray down the table and you're seeing another patient straight away does that make sense or actually have you got four consulting rooms and you're only using one and therefore you use one spray down the table, leave the F10 on the table, use the other room and come back again afterwards. And, and just as we talked about um, uh, falcons going into a hospital and having clean and dirty patients, again, with a normal companion animal veterinary practice, you do exactly the same. If you have more than one consulting room, you have a dirty room and you have a clean room. So your animals that are coming in for routine surgeries, their spays, the castrates, the orthopedic surgery and so on, they come in preferably at a different time when your dirty patients aren't around, preferably before they, they've been around and they go through a clean consulting room, whereas those wild, injured wildlife, stray animals, those that have obviously got a medical infection are treated as a dirty patient and go through a dirty consulting room, which is, and the other thing is remember, you clean any area or any surface proportionate 
to the level of contamination. So the dirtier the room, the more often you clean it, and the more frequently you have to do a deep clean. And remember, when you do a deep clean, you must remove the lipid surface layer, the little layer of grease that is on every surface, because that's where the microbes are trapped. And that's where you use the F10, um, sorry, the, yeah, the F10 919, uh, which is the degreasing agent. Really, really important that when you do your deep clean, you'd use the degreaser first. Um, there's another. 919 is my favorite as well. Yeah, we've, had, we've tried it in our practice at our in our office as well and uh, in common areas. It is uh, an effective uh, a product. Yeah, Sorry. it's not a disinfectant, so you don't use it instead of a disinfectant. You use it as I say as a degreaser. It's there to take that lipid surface layer off. Then you disinfect, and you don't use it every day. You just do it when you're doing your deep clean. Um, we just got another question on the uh, the chat box here. Mohammed is yeah. asking, does F10 leave any residue that can be traced in food produced for, from animals uh, uh, in, in eggs or milk? Um, in, in the, I, mean, I have to say, there are fairly limited surveys that have been done by Health and Hygiene, and this was just in uh, poultry and in ostriches, and in those situations, no traces was found and, and everything seemed good. Uh, I'm not aware, I may be wrong, but I'm not aware of any uh, studies that have been done in uh, beef, for example, or in milk or cheese. I would be very confident there won't be any, but I, I don't think the tests have been done. Okay, we've received Dr. Mason's question via chat. He would like to know, for how long can we add F10 to the poultry drinking water? Well, in, in the study that was done by Health and Hygiene, they had F10 in the water through the whole of their growing cycle. So as Jaime said, you know, these animals don't live for a long time, maybe 68 days or so for, for poultry that are growing for meat. Uh, and in that, in that situation, as I say, health and hygiene had F10 added the whole way through the growing cycle. Um, and bizarrely, it didn't have a negative effect on the gut flora of the poultry, and there wasn't any meat residue, and the poultry did really well. Thank you, expert. We, uh, this will be our last question because we've reached towards the end of our time. Yeah. It's in the chat box. Okay, have we, we got any more questions? Any last question from anyone? There is no, nothing on the box. Oh, sorry. No, the, this. There isn't any question. Okay, so I, I think if we can just wrap this up, but uh, you know, I, I've gone on about it and maybe you'll say I'm boring about it, but I really want to, to share with you, I mean, Jaime and I deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis. We see so many situations where historically, people have ignored the risk. They're mixing birds together, they're mixing cats and dogs together, dirty and clean animals, they can spread of infection. So it's all about having a good biosecurity policy working out what your risks are, how you manage them, doing the cleaning properly, doing the disinfection properly, as I say, using a disinfectant proportionate to the risk of contagion occurring. And, and just one last thing I would say is, it, you know, a lot of people use, they, they get things cleaned and they disinfect them and they assume, because we've done it, everything's okay. Um, there are ways of measuring how clean everything is afterwards. And I've done this in my own hospital and I found it so useful. Um, and one of the things we need to, we should just mention is fomites. So someone comes in, let's say into a, a veterinary consulting room, the, the doctor feels the patient, uh, manipulates it, does things to it. Then they open a door, they turn a tap on, they use a computer keyboard, they pick up a stethoscope. All of those things potentially become contaminated. And they're what we call fomites. And we can then pass infection from them onto anywhere else. And the difficulty is you don't necessarily know where you, what your fomites are in your facility. And in our hospital, what we found was the little valves that we twisted to turn the anesthetic gas up and down on the anesthetic machines, very difficult to clean. And of course the anesthetist or the nurse, they feel they check the animal's uh, membranes and its eye, and then they do the anesthetic machine, then they go back to the animal. 
does that anesthetic machine get cleaned between one patient or even one day and another? Possibly not. Are, are patient restraint devices, foam wedges and things were a problem. Um, and uh, x-ray machines, the little knobs to turn things up and down, they were a problem. And lastly, just to share with you, the, the consistently most contaminated thing in our facility was we had a hot water uh, unit so staff could walk into the staff room, fill up their coffee cup with water and walk out again. And because it wasn't in a clinical area, no one was thinking of cleaning it with yeah. a disinfectant. And that was a real source of, 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 conta of contamination. So you can use what I use is something called adenine triphosphate, ATP testing. There are other things you can use, but you do need a way to monitor how effective that's not to say the F10 is not working. It will work if it's used in, in every place where it needs to be used. But I found that really, really useful. Uh, thank you all for spending time with us. Hopefully you found this useful. I would encourage you and invite you to look at the other uh, Bird of Prey webinars we have produced. And in time, we will hopefully produce lots more uh, with uh, little tips uh, from people like Jaime and myself and from people who look after animals, um, people uh, who who rear them and work with them uh, to help you all do a better job uh, in controlling infection and using F10 in all the appropriate ways that uh, we found useful over the years. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Forbes and Dr. Jamie for joining us today. I'm sure the whole session was very insightful for all our audience. You're live and connected virtually across GCC and of course, South Africa. Until next time, we will send out more information. A live recording of this webinar will be shared with all. Thank you all. Yeah, thank Pleasure. you for inviting us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next time. Yeah. Bye. <laughs>